a lot of people died because of hunger so that we as kids would every morning go out with gunny sacks to the railroad yards to pick up anything burnable and edible and we did that every day why did we do it because if the parents want or the mother would go she would get shot what did you eat what was on your plate whatever you could find whatever in anything there was not such a thing as a meal there was just what can you do to fill into your tummy leftovers at some store that was uh, making bread or or leftovers or anything that you found on the ground anything i still feel today the feeling of hunger I still have that today. I always looked at the Germans as we were all victims. Everybody became a victim and the name that was driving it obviously was Hitler. Did Hitler have any supporters in Holland? Were there any anti-Semitic yeah. groups? Yeah, there were some people that were supportive of Hitler. They were severely punished for that after the war and women as well as men, but brought there, women were shaved, all their hair was shaved off and a number of men were killed, mm. shot with a gun. We were standing close by there and watching it. What gives one hope when you're just trying to survive every day and there's hunger and there's cold? What were you, what did you hope for? What, what kept you going? That's something I also wonder about people who were in concentration camps. I came to a conclusion that the reason why some people survive concentration camps and others not is because they have a vision. So what I want to say is... One should not be a victim. One should not be a perpetrator. But above all, one should not be a bystander. We are now beginning to understand the mystery of why Holocaust happened, each in our own way. Some believe it was evil, some believe it was Hitler, and some believe it was the German citizens who let it happen. We often prefer not to discuss the atrocities that happened in the concentration camps of Nazi Germany during the Holocaust. However, due to potential future traps, we might have to, in order to not make the same mistakes again and take the same road down into the rabbit hole. In this video, I talk to John Brink, who spent his childhood in Holland after Germans invaded. He shares his awful memories of everyday life under the Nazi occupation and what it takes to survive when misery is all around you. He is also the author of Against All Odds, a book in which he talks about coming to Canada, the country of his liberators, with less than $26 in his pocket, and from doing that to being a successful business owner. Enjoy the video. And I've listened to your story, and it's pretty fascinating. Have you read any books about Nazi Germany? Because I've read Mein Kampf, and then I read a lot about Hitler, and a lot of books that were written by Holocaust survivors. I, I have obviously looked at numerous programs. I've written or uh, uh, read some books about it. I'm ADHD. And you write books for people with ADHD. Yes. So you have to make it really enticing. Exactly. You know, e even with people who don't have ADHD, currently the retention, the attention span is actually eight seconds. It used to be a couple of minutes. It went down to a minute. Now it's eight seconds. I think your knowledge is actually very useful for content creators like me because you have people, your, your audience is people with ADHD. So you must know how to grab their attention and keep it. I think you should be, I think you should be doing workshops on content creators, how to keep listeners attention. I think that'd be really useful. At what age did you notice you had ADHD? You know, I was born in Holland and uh, in 1940 and uh, we were liberated by the canadian army april the 12th 1945. i believe i was affected by ptsd post uh, you know and, and because we saw far too much that we should not have seen it was very difficult in the area where i was born northeastern holland my mom was alone my dad was drafted in the uh, in the dutch army and we didn't see him back for five years and thought that, uh, you know, he likely had uh, had been killed. Uh, uh, but then he came back five years later. It was a very, very difficult time for my mom. She had uh, me. I was the youngest. Uh, I had uh, a sister that was one year older and a brother that was two years older. So it was a difficult time. I was not very good in school. Uh, I failed grade three and I failed grade seven three times. My parents and other people said, well, what are we going to do with him? 
and they thought maybe we should we have to send them to a school for the mentally challenged or be at 14 we get them a job and so i then they decided fortunately to get me a job and i was trained as a furniture maker oh and so the adhd was not a consequence of ptsd it was already no. present before that oh i believe always present so the other part about it was that Th that when we were liberated by the Canadians, my dream was to go to Canada, even at five years old, the land of my heroes. And I knew I would go. It was not if, but when. I tried to go when I was 17. My parents wouldn't let me. And then I was drafted into the Dutch Air Force for two years. And then I left Holland when I was 24. In Holland, the way it was that if you didn't have diplomas and you didn't finish high school and university, college, whatever, I, I always had difficulty with that. I couldn't figure out why I did not. And I wanted to prove to myself that I was as good as the others. And I decided to test myself and uh, go to Canada, start out with no money, left with $150 from Amsterdam. When I arrived here, I had one suitcase, three books, $25.47. Then at one day I walked into a store here and I opened the book and in the book, the book said driven to distraction. And I looked at it and, and I still don't know why today is that it started talking about ADHD. And I said, oh my God, that is me. I was going through the book and through the book, finally the guy that owned the store finally came up to me and said, are we going to buy it or what are we doing here? I wrote in the book then now in Dutch, because I was ashamed of it. Now I finally know who I am. I found out when I was probably 62. Isn't that liberating, huh? To know that yeah. you're especially knowing that you're not alone in this because it's no. a diagnosed condition and you're not alone and you finally know what the hell is going on. I feel like it's it, so liberating. I believe it's a superpower that yes. allows me to do 20 things all at the same time. Now, in what way is your PTSD showing in your everyday life now? It's always with me in a way, not in a direct way, but in any direct way. Even now, you know, I was five when we were liberated. I'm 82 now. So 77 years later, I still become emotional about it. Are your siblings still with you? Uh, with me means, yeah, they're still alive. Uh, do you ever talk with them about the experience of the invasion? Not much. Not but, much. But yeah. Enough. More so than my experience, not unique to me, I'm sure. My dad, when he came back from the war, after being gone for five years, uh, my mom had no contact with him, didn't know he was dead or alive. The last time that he saw him was in the bombing of Rotterdam. Not many people survived in the center of Rotterdam. When he came back, he became a marked individual. He wouldn't, he had difficulty emotionally, I believe, never talked about his experiences at all. Uh, he became what I call a closet alcoholic and a lot of that to, had to do with uh, his experiences. I feel like they should almost have a halfway house, forced war version, you know, when people come home from war and their families and they can get to know each other again, especially for people who have been in a war for a very long time. How do you get back to family life after that? How do you just go back to normal? When you come back, you're you're in shock. Everything is, you, you cannot just slide into a life like that. The, the, the scary part about it is, Yuriska, that, uh, you know, the likelihood is they will never be the same again. The individuals that have been exposed to trauma, both my mother with the three kids, and where every member of the family was busy trying to survive themselves, and she had, uh, I was born, born November the 1st, uh, 1940. He already had been gone then for six months. My brother, my sister was one year old, my brother two years older. And uh, towards the, uh, I still remember the war from the time that I was three and a half, bombers overhead, up to 300 bombers overhead, because again, visualize as you can, is that the bombers came in from primarily the UK and then flew as much over water as they could to avoid flak from the ground and then came over eastern, northeastern Holland 
and then bombing Germany. We were within 10 minutes of the German border. Again, if you can visualize Germany, uh, you know, Germany touches the North Sea or the inlet uh, by Denmark. We could see fires burning, you know, during the night. And then from 1943 forward, we had day and nighttime bombing, hundreds mm. of bombers overhead. The sound of 350 bombers overhead is, is I, there is nothing like that. Once you hear that, you will never forget it. In the right. meantime, obviously, uh, the winter of 1944, 1945 was extremely severe in Holland. A lot of people died because of hunger and it was so cold. So that we as kids would every morning go out with gunny sacks to the railroad yards to pick up anything burnable and edible. And we did that every day. Why did we do it? Because if the parents want, or the mother would go, she would get shot. In our case, they would try to catch us and put us one in the back, you know, but that's what we did every day. And then we had the house with the little room in the house that we had one heater, very small room, uh, because the rest of the house, the, there was no heat. And, uh, you know, and that's where we sat uh, to try to stay warm. And, uh, and that was every day like that. And everybody else had the same issues, the same problems. We had people in the neighborhood or from the area. I didn't know them myself, but that were picked up and were sent to Germany, mainly Jewish individuals, and uh, they never returned. And there were several hundred in our area that never came back, you know, so. Uh, and then in particular at the liberation, uh, we were liberated by the Canadian Army on April the 12th, 1945. And uh, the, the Germans were making their way back to their border and we were very, very close to that. They pushed them, the Canadians pushed them all the way from Southern Holland through the coast along Amsterdam. By then they had, the Germans had nothing left. They would uh, steal any bike, any transportation they could find, and they would blow up every bridge to slow down the following Canadian army. So there was a bridge in front of our house that was blown up. I still remember even that part. And then the other part, uh, you know, when the Germans were retreating, they were very, very nervous, very worried. Uh, and one of uh, our neighbors uh, stood in front of the window. He was shot got a bullet through the one eye and out of the back. I still remember that looking at the individual laying there and then seeing several people on a cart, uh, you know, where legs were standing out in arms, you know, and, and those are things that you never forget. Yeah, no. So you mentioned the hunger winter. What did you eat? What was on your plate? Whatever you could find. Whatever. In anything. There was not such a thing as a meal. There was just, what can you do to fill into your tummy? If it were, were, were fruits that you found, or if it was leftovers at some store that was uh, making bread or, or leftovers or anything that you found on the ground, anything. Does hunger anything. change you personality-wise? Because I I don't understand how mm -hmm. one copes with anger. I, I've listened yeah, to- a good question, actually. Yeah, I, I've actually, I've listened to an interview from a North, North Korean defector, and she was talking about how hunger changed her in a way that all she could think about was food. And it, she lost empathy to her fellow citizens. She would see people dying and all she would see is basically potential food. So it changed her personality totally. How did yeah. you cope with that on a daily basis? And how did your personality change because of that? Hunger was something we had all the time, all the time. I still feel today the feeling of hunger. I still have that today. And the other one is it was immensely cold. I still have that feeling today. Uh, you know, the feeling of cold and, and extreme difficult cold and heat because we had this little stove in front of us. And then the other one is anxiety. I still have that today. You know, because it was reacting to the parent. She was the only one. And when the bombers came over and were bombing Germany, we, we would go outside, not to look and say, oh my, look at all the planes. That was not the idea. The idea was that it was safer to be outside and watching them bombing in uh, Northern Germany than it would have been being inside. And there was always 
as kids do, they pick up on that parents, in this case, my mother only, that if she has anxiety, so do I, you know, I can feel it. And uh, much later, probably when I was in my late fifties or sixties, I had, uh, and I was in a relationship and, uh, you know, and uh, with my wife and, uh, you know, we had some difficulty and I got counseling and we got counseling together. And then uh, during the counseling, the counselor said, you know, maybe what we should do is have a talk to John on his own about another issue that relates to the war. This was interesting for me because what he was talking to me about is uh, the inner child. And the inner child is the little boy that never left. What was your everyday life during the occupation? When you woke up, the first thing that was on your mind was probably hunger. What were you doing during the day? Survive, you know, and be close to my mother, you know, because there was nothing else there. Everybody was too busy taking care of their own, whatever they had left, uh, you know, so, and it was anxiety every day because uh, there was no food, especially not in the hunger uh, winter. Not only was the winter extremely cold, uh, you know, the German army in, you know, had decided to block all the food flowing in from other areas. So it was extremely cold, extremely difficult, and, and people had nothing to eat. A lot of kids in particular died, and so did other, other people that were frail and older that died then as well. Thousands, thousands of people died. Did you have both non-Jewish and Jewish friends? What was, do you, do you remember any anti-Semitism growing up? Not really. Not really. Okay. No. What was what was the treatment of Jews in Dutch society? Because it seems as if, correct me if I'm wrong, but reading, it seems as if the Dutch society kind of suppressed Jews from publicly voicing attempts to receive special treatment as victims. Because I know that in July 1945, there was a resistance magazine, The Patriot, and they kind of stress, stressed the proper role of Jews in post-war Dutch society. Because I, I read an article that said, now it's time for Jews to remind themselves all the time that they have to be thankful. It is also possible to kind of lose sympathy. They are certainly not the only ones who had bad time and who suffered. I'm, I'm quoting this now. Right. So I have never experienced that, uh, Yuriska. In fact, to the contrary, that I would not know if somebody is Jewish or not Jewish, I, and, and even still today, I have no preference to anybody, whatever color they have, uh, whatever religions they follow, whatever choices they make in terms of uh, uh, sexuality or whatever relationships they have. I always believe that if people love each other, that's very good, whatever their gender may be. And, uh, and that's kind of uh, who I am. That feeling of uh, resentment against the Jewish people in particular, I have never experienced that ever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, and I certainly would not have that feeling. The other part I should mention, I believe it's just important is that, you know, that I always looked at the Germans as that, although we were very close to them, 10 minutes away, we were all victims. They were too, you know, and very quickly after the war, we were exchanging students from the schools with the ones across the border in Germany everybody became a victim and the name that was driving it obviously was Hitler, uh, not unlike what we now see with Putin and some of these other terrible, terrible individuals around the world. He's another classic example of a narcissist that has no sympathy for anything or anybody. And, uh, you know, and, and where the Russian people are not bad people, as you well know, it is they are just like you and me just trying to get by. Uh, unfortunately, their leadership, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the, that sooner that he disappears, the better it is. So we, we were very much uh, interacting uh, with the Germans. And the funny part about it, and, and if there is one, and we have to at some point get to the point that we can look back at not only remembering how difficult it was and all the ongoing uh, it may be PTSD, may be anxiety, may be the inner child or whatever it is, uh, but still very much part of it. And then, but also kind of looking at if I go to Holland today and I still have a place that I still go, try to go other than for COVID, we didn't go. I try to go two times is then, uh, you know, that the, the German 
license plates in our hometown are probably 50% of them. And so the, the two the two communities are very closely interacted. I hear from time to time is think about what the Germans did when they tried to get back to their country and they had no, no fuel left for their vehicles. They had all the vehicles were gone. They had nothing left other than a gun and some bullets. And they would take and steal all the bikes that they could find to get back to the country. So then kind of look back 50 years later, every so often, we see somebody saying, uh, they see Germans and they say, where is my bike? <laughs> 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 you know, so on the comical side. So, but the interaction obviously under the European Union, you know, things have dramatically changed. There is no physical border. There is a border, but you can drive right through and, and interacting. And I think that's a good thing. How would you say we should fight anti-Semitism today? What's the good way of fighting it? And oh, by the way, did Hitler have any supporters at all in Holland? Were there any anti-Semitic yeah. groups? Yeah, there were. There were, uh, uh, you know, the uh, some people that were supportive of Hitler. They were severely punished for that after the war, and uh, and I have some experience of that. You know, when I was a five-year-old boy, we had a canal in front of our house, and and we had locks in the canal where you can open one to level the two if boats would go through. And a lot of people that were then supporters, women as well as men, but broad there, women were shaved, all their hair was shaved off, and a number of men were killed, shot with a gun. We were standing close by there and watching it. So you guys were watching them being shot. Was that difficult to watch or was the revenge too big? If you're five years old, and I find it amazing with my grandchildren, how observant you are and how much you will remember, especially when there is trauma and anxiety by the parent. You know, there was fear for me always to lose the parent, hence the inner child, not well understood by a lot of people. The little boy that watched all of these things happen was still very much present. So what do we body. do with what do we do with anti-Semitism today? Do you believe these people are do not, actually bad? I do not do not tolerate it. If somebody comes near me with that, I will not tolerate it. But may it apply to not only the Jewish uh, people. Uh, I don't care if they are black, white, yellow, green, uh, male, female, gay, whatever they are. Respect others. Do you see Hitler as evil? Oh, there's no question about it. I see Putin as e evil. I see Kim in North Korea as evil. I have questions about the guy in China and on and on and on. Yeah, I see those people as evil. I think we will always have those type of individuals. I don't know them. I just know them by their deeds that they are doing. If I look at what is happening in the Ukraine today, it is absolutely unbelievable. And then the other thing that is troubling is that we're doing everything to help them, but we're not doing enough yet. We have to provide them with the weapons. The Ukrainians, amazing what they are doing and, and the price they pay, they will stop Putin. The Russians have to decide that this man is not good for them. And, uh, uh, you know, and then look at their system. But uh, I don't know the individual, but other than by the deeds that he has now, he should not be tolerated in the world. Speaking on fighting back, Amsterdam in World War II, that's something that not a lot of people know, but on per capita basis, the Netherlands had the most people hiding Jews from the occupying forces. But you know, the Netherlands kind of remained neutral. So the Dutch government was kind of careful not to take an official stand on the situation in Nazi Germany. If Holland was neutral, why invade it? Yeah, that's an interesting question. The same was with Switzerland and some of the other places. Uh, you know, everybody was trying to uh, stay neutral and not getting involved. Yeah. But as you know, Blitzkrieg that happened, the invasion was, uh, you know, they just overran Holland. They had no ability to defend themselves against uh, Germany. They were far, far too powerful. Stalin was also just shocked when Hitler invaded Russia because they were supposed to be buddies. It seems as if Hitler had no limitations whatsoever and it was just no. up to him. Whatever he wants to invade, he's going to do it. Reminds me of Putin. 
that's how the rest of the world is feeling about this. What do you think Hitler's actual goal was? What was he really loving his Aryan race, or was there a no. <laughs> malevolent inner inner demon acting out? The guy is a sick sick individual again didn't care about anything or anybody he's a narcissist a classic individual that is evil and likely i don't uh, i i've not read about him as much as you likely have but uh, he he was in the first world war he was wounded in that first world war he was uh, totally obsessed about the fact that germany lost then he had this deep deep and glued hate for the jews and uh and and other people that oppose them and you know if hitler was successful for a lot longer i tend to question myself where would he stop because he started with jews then he started with yeah but jews are also people whose grandfather or grandmother was jewish they expanded the definition of people towards which he was disgusted it, it really makes me think if he was blonde would he only want to keep blonde people you know like would he keep on eliminating more and more people and eradicating everyone it was really he must have hated the fact that he was actually brown I, I think he would love to be someone who has blonde hair and blue eyes because then he could eradicate more people right so what? it makes me wonder where do you think he would stop towards Jews? He he didn't really, well, yeah, he, he did hate them, but I think it was more disgust than anything else. It wasn't really fear. It was disgust. It was kind of like they were a disease of some sort. In his book, he was talking about how he was walking up and down Vienna in Austria, and he would see a Jew and it make him want to vomit almost. You can certainly discriminate and hate a certain group of people, but why disgust? Well, I cannot possibly imagine. Do you think he was born evil? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, makes you wonder, doesn't it? And, and if uh, born evil, I, I kind of think that most of the, as you likely know, is the people that uh, the, the little infants that come into our life, you watch them and it's a picture of innocence, you know, so, uh, I, I, it's just hard for me to imagine that, you know, that, uh, you know, what caused them to go there, I have no idea. And how long will everyone tolerate what's happening in North Korea? Because we like to complain about Holocaust and regret how we didn't do anything, but the Holocaust is actually happening right now in North Korea. People are dying of hunger. It's an actual yeah, I, Holocaust. The amazing thing about that, uh, Yuriska, and I don't claim to be an expert on this, I'm simply talking about it like as a caring individual that is just trying to get by, is mm -hmm. that uh, the, the difference, the example that is a classic one, at the end of the day, the people that are in the country will decide how much will they tolerate. And even with Kim in North Korea, it, it cannot be other people that do it for them. They have to stand up and they have to say enough and then things will change. We see that in uh, the Ukraine as a classic example, we saw the opposite of that happening in Afghanistan, the horror and terror, the Americans were in there and others were in there, but it will not be changed until the public stands up and say, no more. If they have the courage, and that's another example of where religion has gone too far, Mm -hmm. You know, and, and then became evil, in fact. I'm agnostic. I'm not particular religious in any form other than a lot of stuff is happening that I have no explanation for. They have to stand up and say no more. And it just takes time, I think. But to have other countries go in there, like the Americans or whoever else, I don't think it's the right thing to do. The people have to decide no longer. May 10th, 1940, around 3 a.m., how do you remember that moment? Do you even remember it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Were they bombs? Did you hear airplanes? What was that like? Because uh, I assume you were sleeping. It was in the middle of the night. Oh, no. We were not sleeping because they flew right over our house. For the last 10, 12, 15 years, I've always made it a point to speak some of, to some of the schools here about what I remember of the war. 
and we would go, as I said earlier, uh, my mom would take us outside because they was worried that, you know, we were so close to the border with Germany that we could see burning of right all the way up to Hamburg, uh, Kiel, Bremen, and right across the border because that was bordering on the sea. And we would see them being attacked and fighting of planes in the air or being shot. Several planes came down in northern Holland that we would see. So we see fire or, or the, 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 the looking of fire in a distance, uh, you know, the cities burning and then planes coming back and some of them being on fire or, uh, or uh, you know, coming down. Yeah. The actual invasion was more on the ground until they decided that Holland didn't capitulate quick enough for them. And so they then bombed Rotterdam. And I don't know if you've been in Rotterdam, yes. uh, you know, that the whole downtown of Rotterdam is new because they leveled it. What gives one hope? when you're just trying to survive every day and there's hunger and there's cold, what were you, what did you hope for? What, what kept you going? That's something I also wonder about people who were in concentration camps. I came to a conclusion that the reason why some people survive concentration camps and others not is because they have a vision. They no. have hopes about the future and they have no, no question maybe not that. a plan, but a vision. And some people don't have a vision. So yeah. what do you think about that? What, what helped, what kept you up? The strength in our family was my mother and uh, the other kids. And it was a question of how do we survive? Where do we find food? Where do we find something to eat? And when we came home with our gunny sacks, that was exciting because it was something that would keep us alive. And that's what it was all about. It was not go and seeing, oh, we have fam, we visit with the family, we play cards and we do this and that and we watch TV, yeah. none of that. That was not even existing at the time. Everything turned around survival and, and, and hope and that things would get better. How do we make sure that we don't go back to the Holocaust? Do you, do you think there is a possibility of another Holocaust happening in the future if we're not careful? Yeah, that's a very, very interesting question, Yuriska, because I thought Ukraine would never happen again. Yeah, either. Yeah. And 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 so, but I'm saying is that the key now is hope for the best, prepare for the worst. The worst likely is uh, prepare for the worst is that these other countries in in Central Europe, in particular in Western Europe, have to unite in under the umbrella of NATO. I believe that is the only thing that will protect us from the future and seeing that atrocities like this one committed by Putin will not happen again. If we don't do that, then everything is possible. Even we would, I'm sure in the late thirties, never have thought that what happened would happen and millions, millions of people would be murdered in the process, you know, so, uh, so my advice would be become united, you know, and especially under the umbrella of NATO, if they attack one, they attack all. And then the other one is do not tolerate, do not tolerate discrimination, uh, you know, for any reason, may that be being Jewish, may that be uh, Catholic, may be whatever, gender choices of sexual preferences, all those things, uh, you know, let's be tolerant and respect each other first and foremost. And to also stand up soon enough, because I feel like in Germany, it was kind of like the process of a boiling frog. You know how they boil frogs? They they don't put it in a boiling water, they put it in a cold water, and then they increase the temperature little by little until the frog just boils. And it's kind of like the Germans were like, okay, this is the procedure that we have right now. After this, there will be no more. Juice cannot work. After this, that's it. They cannot work and that's okay. And then they pushed it a little bit and then a little bit and then a little bit more. And then before they knew it, they were, well, they were basically boiling, right? So it's kind of yeah. like standing up soon enough. Now, soon enough is a question of, well, it's, it's kind of subjective, but I would say that that's our best shot. Like that's the best we can do to prevent anything like this from happening ever again. 
and and then and then uh, be vocal about it uh, you know yeah. you, you yeah, will definitely. you will know it when you see it right so then you have the choice of saying nothing or saying something and it simply will not be tolerated and the more people take that particular approach the less chance there is for these fanatic individuals and that will not stop those people will be born they will try to dominate and we have numerous examples of it even somewhat in the united states being vocal is very important i talked to a guy who was in afghanistan under the taliban i had an interview with an iranian guy who well i cannot put that out there yet because he would be very much punished but i will and both of them told me that how other people can help is to speak up and be vocal about it and i hear that over and over again and the lady that was interviewed the north korean defector she also said well maybe if you cannot help these people directly talk about it and it's you know it's it's amazing how much we can do with this technology if we just talk about these problems it, it's amazing yeah yeah i agree you know day you calling me from slovenia and I'm sitting in Central British Columbia, and 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 there we're talking like this. It feels like we're sitting side by side. It really helps if we look at this world as our house, right? Yeah. And it's two exactly. members talking about, okay, what's going on in our house? There is a problem in the living room. What do we do to not have that problem in the kitchen? You know what I mean? The communicating and 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 honest communications, right? There's always going to be political stuff, you know, and all that type of stuff. But I think honesty and openness. And actually saying what you think, I think that's what can save us from future atrocities. I agree, uh, Yuriska. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm not going to keep you for much longer. Sorry about that. It was amazing. <laughs> Where can people find you? JohnAbrink.com for one. Uh, you know, we watch, uh, uh, we do podcasting, as you already know, uh, on the brink with John A. Brink. Uh, we are on all major media. Uh, Facebook uh, is a good one, and Instagram. Oh, you have Instagram as well. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, just started a TikTok page as well. Okay, well, anyway, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a very pl pleasurable experience. Uh, kind of dark, but also very educating.